The following program contains images that may be disturbing for some viewers. The Mafia were one of the most dangerous and secret criminal organizations in the world. Their activities began on the Italian island of Sicily and were soon exported to America, where it became La Cosa Nostra. In a century of great world wars and political assassinations, the Mafia came to play a key role in the game of history. Back and forth in time and space between Italy and America, the footsteps of the great Mafia bosses can be traced. The great dons that became known as Godfathers. In Sicily, in 1893, 31-year-old Vito Cassioferro, who had been affiliated with the Mafia in his early 20s, was now a so-called Man of Honor. In the late 19th century, the Mafia was a secret, mysterious society that was feared by the local peasants. No one even dared call it Mafia. But in the rural community, a new social movement had begun to evolve called the Sicilian Fasci. It spoke of justice, progress and democracy. Because of its success in the countryside, Cassioferro understood that this movement could make him even more powerful. He infiltrated the Sicilian Fasci, posing as a socialist. He clutched the hammer and sickle along with a shotgun and images of the Madonna. Little did it matter to him that the Sicilian Fasci fought against landowners and against the Mafiosi. Eventually the government of Rome sent in the army. As the result of the military repression, more than a hundred people died. Hundreds more were wounded and arrested and the Sicilian Fasci were banned. The defeat brought the dreamers to their knees and many left for the new world. Those who stayed went back to working the land. In America, Vito Cassioferro took off his socialist mask and set out to use all his power to become a godfather, Don Vito. In New Orleans in 1890, Two Mafia families, the Matrangas and the Provenzanos, had been fighting over control of the docks, an essential front for their criminal business, a port of entrance for illegal trafficking. They call it a family probably to, to soften it. It's not a family, it's an it's a illegal business organization <laughs> in which a group of men pledge loyalty to each other, divide up different areas of business and divide up the profits that they're making. In the streets of New Orleans, the Mafia had a legitimate front selling oranges. In 1888, the Matranga and the Provenzano families had started their fight over control of the docks. These families exist to make money. They will resort to anything in order to continue their criminal operations up to and including murder. Uh, in many cases, even murdering innocent people who aren't even involved in the criminal operations. Between 1888 and 1890, over 40 people were killed in the so-called War of the Oranges. Among the victims was New Orleans police chief David Hennessy, who had been investigating mafia activities in the area. A public outcry followed his assassination. In March 1891, a dozen Sicilians were suspected of his murder and arrested. The angry mob stormed the jail where the suspects were held, dragged them onto the street and lynched them. A headline in The Item, a local New Orleans newspaper read, Justice is done. 
American President Benjamin Harrison, however, expressed his personal outrage and gave $25,000 to the family of each lynched man. The rival families went into hiding. Every family withdrew into its shell, applying the mafia proverb that says, bend back like a rush until the flood passes. The War of the Oranges weakened the Mafia families. Too many Picciotti, or soldiers, had died. Too much energy had been spent in the clashes rather than on racketeering, prostitution and gambling. To Cosa Nostra, a war is absolutely no game. It's something you engage in only if unavoidable. It is in the DNA of Cosa Nostra to avoid any internal clash because it would mean an opportunity for the police to investigate and fight them. For centuries, Sicily hadn't had a government. It had always been a land of conquest, dominated by the Greeks, the Arabs, the Normans, the Spanish. None of them had been remotely interested in the Sicilians, their welfare or protection. Men like Don Vito Cacioferro replaced the government using favors and violence as godfathers. Why godfather? Why padrino? Because their authority is so complete. It's like a dictatorship. You know, there's no legislature. There's no rule-making body, they don't consult, they don't go to the flock, they don't go to the voters, it's the boss. The boss says what's right, the boss says what's wrong, and people follow him. Don Vito wanted to be invisible in the eyes of the law, but in the eyes of the people, he wanted to be known as the friend of all friends. A mafia godfather is like everyone's father. He is recognized by the lowest ranks as the man who administers justice and fixes wrongdoings. He is a man you can turn to for a job. Don Vito Cacioferro didn't carry a gun. His weapons were cynicism and intelligence. But those caught in the godfather's net knew every favor had to be repaid. But we also can't forget that if the old godfather's orders were not obeyed, he issued a death sentence. In 1902, 40-year-old Don Vito Cacioferro passed through Ellis Island, blending in with the other emigrants. He wanted to become a player in illegal business like gambling, prostitution, human trafficking and wanted control of racketeering in the United States. He started in New York City's East Harlem. In America, many of the Italian gangsters belonged to an organization called the Black Hand. This did not prevent them from clashing with each other over control of criminal activity, as in New Orleans. Don Vito saw his chance for real power lay in peace among all the factions. He started to build alliances between gangs of the Black Hand. Extortion was bread and butter to the Black Hand. Victims were told to pay up to avoid being kidnapped or even murdered. The Black Hand even had the audacity to extort the famous Italian tenor Enrico Caruso. Following his debut in November 1903 with Giuseppe Verdi's Rigoletto, Caruso started performing at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City on a regular basis. In 1907, after one show, the tenor found a note in his dressing room, in Italian. The Black Hand demanded $2,000 for his life. Caruso paid, but then a second note arrived. This time, the demand was for $15,000.
The extent of criminal activities perpetrated by the Black Hand led the New York Police Department to create an elite core of Italian-American undercover officers, the Italian branch. Its chief was Lieutenant Joe Petrosino. He had come to New York from Italy with his family at the age of 13 and enrolled in the New York Police Department 10 years later. In 1905, police commissioner and future president Theodore Roosevelt appointed him sergeant. As the lieutenant in charge of the Italian branch, his ambition was to defeat the Mafia, which he saw as bringing shame to his mother country and fellow countrymen. Joe Petrosino convinced Enrico Caruso to set a trap to catch his blackmailers. Despite such setbacks, it was business as usual for the Black Hand. Criminal business that was even reflected on the screen by directors like D.W. Griffith in the early days of motion pictures. Meanwhile, Don Vito Cacioferro put his most trusted men in key positions in New York. He needed to be able to commute back and forth between America and Italy. Sicily was changing, and his business was in trouble. In Italy in 1890, Emanuele Nortobartolo, general manager of the Banco di Sicilia, realized his bank was laundering dirty money for the Mafia. He tried to stop it and was sacked, but went on investigating alone. To stop him, on February the 1st, 1893, they stabbed him to death on a train. The person accused of instigating the murder was an Italian member of parliament, Raffaele Palizzolo. But behind him was the great godfather, Don Vito Cacioferro, who had had Palizzolo elected and pulled his strings. In the first major trial against the Mafia held in Bologna in 1902, Deputy Palizzolo was found guilty and sentenced to 30 years in prison. But then Don Vito Cacioferro used his godfather authority. The most influential members of Sicilian society began to mobilize, accusing the Italian government of discriminating against Sicily. Lawyers brought the case to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Palizzolo was acquitted in 1904 for lack of evidence. Don Vito Cacioferro organized a triumphant return to Palermo for Palizzolo. Then, in 1908, sent him to America. Assemblies were organized in New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Chicago, and New Orleans. Wherever he went, Palizzolo gave the same speech. He said they had to form a Sicilian organization, an actual government within the government, with its own laws. That speech was written by Don Vito, with phrases that had a double meaning, which only the Mafia could understand. Sicilians need to know how to engage in politics, said Palizzolo. What he meant was, godfathers must know how to engage in politics in order to become really powerful. Joe Petrosino, 
understood the Sicilian dialect. He understood the coded message hidden behind the innocent words. The important thing about Petrosino is that he was quintessential anti-mafia and that if you did an analysis of the Italian-American experience, the children, the sons and daughters of those giants, the immigrants, and they were giants, the numbers would show you that there is a great, great disproportion. There are many more Joe Petrosino types. Petrosino discovered that the man pulling the strings of racketeering was not really based in America, but in the mafia heartland of Sicily. In 1909, he left for Palermo on a top secret mission. But on the 20th of February, 1909, the New York Herald broke the story. His investigation was secret no more. Petrosino ignored the obvious danger. But Don Vito Cacioferro was ahead of the game. On the 12th of March, 1909, Joe Petrosino was shot and killed in Palermo's Piazza Marina. There was a funeral in Manhattan for him, and uh, I think over a quarter of a million people at that time uh, went to that funeral. Uh, he was the first Italian-American to be killed in the line of duty. Villalba, a remote village in southern Sicily. Calogero Vizzini had four priests in his family among whom were his brothers Don Salvatore and Don Giovanni, as priests are addressed in Italy. Calogero was born in 1877. At 17, he had his first brush with the law when he was charged with assault. He too aspired to the title of Don, but in its criminal sense, as the mark of respect due to a true godfather. There were pretensions of grandeur in the Mafia, you know, the, the idea that they were recreating the Roman legions and uh, that maybe that insulated some of them from the reality of the fact that they were pretty vicious common criminals. In 1891, from the Vatican, Pope Leo XIII issued the encyclical Rerum Novarum, a papal document whose title meant of new things. It was truly the era of new things, not only in Italy, but in most of the Western world. Big machines, powerful ships, impressive dams. In their sermons, the four priests in Don Vizzini's families cried out against the exploitation of women and children who were paying the highest price for progress in Italy. Among the many new things, one thing stayed the same. Sicily had no proper government to take care of the Sicilians. Don Vizzini pretended to be a unionist and gave jobs to the unemployed. The life of Vizzini has been very peculiar. He never got married. His only interest was power, the reverence. That's one of the characteristics of a godfather. A godfather becomes powerful when he is able to have his orders carried out. In New York City in the mid-twenties, Joe Masseria was the most powerful godfather in town. He preferred to be called the boss. It sounded more American to him. Reporting to Masseria were soldiers like Salvatore Lucania, the young boy who had come to America in 1906, Carlo Gambino and Vito Genovese. They were called 
the Young Turks. When the Mafia is at its strongest, those destined to be men of honor are given a specific kind of education. It's a school. When the First World War broke out, the Mafia was ready for it. Italy called its emigrants home. Instead of going back, many hid, afraid of losing the job they had found in America. They asked for help, and the Godfathers were ready with favors. When America entered the war in 1916, they poured money into Italy for new armaments. This time, many Italian Americans enlisted. Don Calogero Vizzini quickly seized the opportunity. He rustled horses, mules, and donkeys, and sold them to the army. But the bigger business was elsewhere. The weapons of the First World War required sulfur. Sicily had a monopoly on sulfur, and Don Vizzini owned enormous mines. His men worked like slaves, naked so that they could bear the heat. He became more and more powerful. The end of the First World War left the European economy in ruins. In America, though, the Mafia was still making money. The godfather of Chicago was Big Jim Colosimo. To protect his criminal business, he recruited a clever and cynical mafioso, Johnny Torrio. Linking up with Torrio turned out to be Big Jim Colosimo's biggest mistake. On January the 16th, 1920, the 18th Amendment, Prohibition, went into effect in the United States. There was money to be made. In Chicago, Johnny Torrio immediately saw this opportunity, but his boss, Big Jim Colosimo, did not. Johnny Torrio recruited a violent young man from Chicago, not brilliant, but smart enough to get the job done, Alphonse Capone. Five months after Prohibition began, Big Jim Colosimo was dead. Torrio, along with Capone, took over trafficking in alcohol. While Capone was power hungry and visible, Johnny the Brain worked backstage to prevent clashes between the gangs. Everyone would get a piece of the action if the right agreement could be reached, but it couldn't. On the 24th of January 1925, he was riddled with bullets and slipped into a coma. Alone at the helm, Al Capone was highly visible. If Johnny the Brain had been around, he would never have let Capone wreak havoc in Chicago with the 1929 Valentine's Day Massacre. One of the hitmen, Frank Frigenti, many years later, described the carnage. Four of us went in on Valentine's Day. We arrived at one o'clock. They were in the garage. We went in with a submachine gun and blew them away. We were dressed like cops because that gang didn't want to be led by Al Capone. Al Capone could only vaguely understand what it meant to be a godfather. He knew that a godfather needed recognition and respect, so he opened up a soup kitchen for the unemployed during the Depression. 
he bragged about being an employer and paying many people's wages. He wanted to think big like a real godfather, but he was just showing off. He never imagined that he'd end up in Alcatraz for a trivial thing like not filing a tax return. And had no idea that one day syphilis would destroy his mind. In New York City in the mid-1920s, before leaving for Sicily once more, Don Vito Cassioferro ordered his lieutenant, Salvatore Maranzano, to stay in town and take care of his business. You'd think that uh, the most successful Italians were the ones who got to be uh, capo de tutti capi. And, um, but that's not true. And, and, and it was improbable because a generation ago, two generations ago, the people who came here were mostly very humble and modest of means. Don Vito's choice of Maranzano did not please Joe the boss, Masseria, who was the most powerful godfather in town. He knew that in Maranzano, he could have a true rival for control of the American families. Both Maranzano and Masseria bolstered their gangs, enlisting new soldiers from Castellamare del Golfo, a beautiful place in Sicily that had become a base for new trafficking. In 1928, when the new Italian fascist regime came down heavily on the Mafia in Sicily, Don Vito Cassioferro was arrested on smuggling charges. With his boss in prison, Maranzano decided the time had come to take over. But he wasn't ready to become a godfather, and the biggest war in the underworld broke out, the Castellamarese War. In one of those clashes on the 16th of October, 1929, one of Masseria's men, Salvatore Lucania, was hit. The killers had left him hanging on a hook, pierced through his throat, convinced he was dead. But Lucania survived and got a new nickname, Lucky Luciano. Engrossed in the Castellamarese War, Maranzano and Masseria did not realize that Lucky Luciano was building a third force. On his side, he had Maya Lansky, a Jewish friend from childhood. Luciano's first step was to eliminate Joe the boss Masseria. Five months later, he killed Salvatore Maranzano as well. But didn't stop there. On the night of the 10th of September, 1931, he took out all the other men still loyal to the two dead bosses. That night is remembered as the Sicilian Vespers. It marked the end of the Castellamarese War. In Atlantic City in 1929, the Godfathers, as if they were heads of state, gathered in a top secret conference. The government takes care of public virtues. We take care of private vices. Luciano is reported to have told the other godfathers. Business, he explained, required a stable environment. The drug market was growing, but they couldn't improvise. Sneaking past customs inspection required a high level of organization. They had to rely on corruption to buy the police and the judges. If Cosa Nostra hadn't followed certain rules, it wouldn't be what it is. Luciano established a round table for the Knights of Darkness, the Commission. Membership in this board of directors for the American Mafia required being recognized as a godfather that controlled a certain area. The boss of all bosses was abolished. No one ranked higher than anyone else. The commission was ruled by many bosses, all of whom were equal. Joe Bonanno described it in his book and described it to me when I interviewed him and, and uh, questioned him. 
as being like the United Nations, which is a rather exalted way to describe it. But he, he, he thought of it as the heads of state coming together and trying to create a peaceful environment in which they can make the maximum amount of money. Other members of the commission suggested Luciano gave a name to this criminal holding company. No names, he replied. No one can refer to this our thing, La Cosa Nostra. We'll be invisible. He also wanted to do away with rituals like finger pricking, collecting of blood drops, and the burning of pictures of saints. Maya Lansky convinced him otherwise, telling him that young people needed rituals so they could believe in something, fear something. The Mafia, without a degree of ritual and sacredness, would mean an entirely different criminal organization. Because it had no name, Luciano's organization did not exist. Even FBI director J. Edgar Hoover was sure of it. In just a few years, history would give the Mafia new opportunities for business. And in that silence, the Mafia would prosper and grow. In 1929, the sudden crash of the stock market triggered the Great Depression. With millions unemployed, it was easier for the underworld to recruit men. Cosa Nostra is not a gang of bank robbers. It's not a series of gangsters all over the territory. In 1933, in Washington, the Democrats won the election. Franklin D. Roosevelt took office and prohibition ended. The new president announced there would be a new deal. Lucky Luciano knew how to make it a new deal for himself. As announced by Roosevelt, the New Deal meant dams, bridges, streets, railways. In other words, enormous contracts. The New Deal brought national labor contracts and labor union growth. The Godfathers were ready for the New Deal of racketeering. Cosa Nostra è una Cosa Nostra is a human phenomenon, made of organized men who want to rule the place they live in and want to make money. This has been the case since the beginning of Cosa Nostra. Controlling the workers and directing the strikes entailed knowing how to ignite and quash them at the right time. That was the new deal for the underworld, not the soup kitchen that Al Capone had opened. By controlling laborers, unions, they were able to control uh, the trucking industry, construction industry, uh, the docks along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Ever since the Sicilian Fasci movement, back at the end of the 19th century, the Godfathers had learned how to disguise themselves as union leaders. In 1930s America, their penetration into American labor unions became a dense tangle of contracts and racketeering, a tool to break into politics. Politics is a tool that the Mafia uses to obtain its own objectives. The historical roots of the Mafia go back in history and feed off a counterculture of its own. In the 1930s, through the labor unions, the Mafia found a way to corrupt politics. Well, how do they corrupt you? With money. They give you money for your campaign. In return, you're supposed to forget about what's good for everybody and do what's good for me because I gave you the money. 
And a lot of that is very successfully done by big money in the United States of America. Should be no surprise, therefore, that the mafia, which has its own uh, organized crime, which has its own desires for its own business, we want to be able to reach a judge to make him more lenient uh, in a case. Now, that's, that's pure corruption. While the Great Depression frayed America, it did not affect the underworld. Lucky Luciano was living it up between nightclubs and strip teasers. He began restructuring the prostitution ring, turning the brothels into supermarkets of sex. Women were his Achilles heel, and New York City's district attorney Thomas Dewey spotted it. He convinced two of them to testify. He gathered enough evidence to arrest and try Luciano for abetting prostitution. On the 2nd of July 1936, the jury pronounced the word guilty 549 times. The sentence was 30 to 50 years in prison. His friend, Maya Lansky, got word to him in prison that one of their soldiers planned to assassinate District Attorney Dewey. No attacks on government officials, the Godfather ordered. So Luciano saved the life of his prosecutor and showed the underworld that he maintained his power even from a prison cell. In 1922, Italy found itself under a fascist dictatorship. Benito Mussolini took power and called himself Il Duce. Two years later, during a trip to Sicily, Mussolini met Don Ciccio Cuccia, a local godfather and town mayor. Don Ciccio said to Mussolini, Your Excellency, you have no need for all these guards. Here you are under my protection, and nothing will happen to you. Another power other than fascism still existed in Sicily. To Mussolini, this was intolerable. It called for immediate action. He asked for an iron-fisted officer and was presented with the unrelenting Cesare Mori as chief of operations. The Prefect of Iron saw Sicily as an occupied enemy territory. Confident he was backed by the dictatorship, he sent in the army and ordered torture. 500 mafiosi managed to escape to the United States, aided by their American cousins. Those who remained in Italy faced hard times. Don Calogero Vizzini, the godfather who had prospered during the First World War with the sulfur mines, was brought to trial and sentenced to five years. But owing to his good relationship with the fascist regime, he was able to regain his freedom after just a few days in prison and returned to his hometown of Villalba. With his investigation, Prefect Mori managed to enter the secret territory where contacts were kept with major banks and mafia families in America. Cesare Mori had gone far too far. The ancient Romans had a saying, let him be promoted and removed. By June 1929, Il Duce was satisfied with the results of Mori, and so was public opinion. The Prefect of Iron was promoted and left Sicily. Vito Genovese One of Joe the Boss Masseria's young Turks had become a ruthless killer by the mid-1930s who had also gained control of many nightclubs and prostitution rings. In 1937, the New York Police Department issued a warrant for his arrest for the murder of Ferdinando Boccia. Genovese was forced to flee to Italy. He became much more than just a fugitive. Even under Italy's fascist regime, he was able to find new ways to do business. In 
1937, 40-year-old godfather Vito Genovese arrived in fascist Italy from America. He was fleeing the New York Police Department, who wanted him on a murder charge. Genovese realized immediately that the Mussolini regime held great opportunities for new business. From America, he ordered shipments of cocaine, a fashionable drug among the Italian intellectual elite. He worked his way into the social circles of Count Galeazzo Ciano, who was married to Edda, Mussolini's favorite daughter. He even financed the building of a fascist party office. When cocaine and money weren't enough to gain acceptance in the regime, he tried other crime. Carlo Tresca, an anti-fascist publisher and enemy of Mussolini, was living in New York. On Vito Genovese's order, Tresca was murdered on Fifth Avenue. In his late 30s, Bugsy Siegel was as handsome as a Hollywood actor. He was also well known as a gunslinger. Passionately dedicated to women, in 1939 he traveled to Italy with one of his mistresses, Countess Dorothy di Frasso. Her plan was to assassinate Mussolini with a bomb. The Countess, in fact, never even tried. Bugsy, however, was now inside what the Nazis called Fortress Europe, a continent under their domination. Bugsy was a gangster and a Jew. Under the Nazis, someone like him was unlikely to make it to the gates of the concentration camp alive. Horrified by anti-Semitism, he left the Countess and returned to America. Meanwhile, the Godfather's commission reprimanded Vito Genovese they had not liked his pro-Mussolini initiatives. The Mafia was against fascism and Nazism. To properly manage its business, it needed democracy, with its freedom and constituted rights. In December 1941, the United States entered the Second World War. It soon discovered that its docks weren't secure, that strikes were still taking place in the factories and that enemy submarines could move right up to the shorelines where the supplies were. A series of attacks spread the idea that Italian, German and Japanese spies had infiltrated the United States. Some saboteurs were captured, tried and executed once more, as in the previous World War, Luciano's Cosa Nostra demonstrated its dexterity at finding new opportunities to increase its power. New York's Navy shipyards were at work on the Normandy. It was the fastest transatlantic ship in the world, able to elude the German U-boats while carrying American troops to Europe. On the 11th of February 1942, the city awoke to a cloud of smoke above the overturned ship. The plan had been conceived by one of Luciano's men, Albert Anastasia. The Mafia wanted to demonstrate that the docks of New York were Cosa Nostra, our thing. The war did not allow any more time. The military had to work with Cosa Nostra. The U.S. Chief of Staff, Admiral Haffenden, and District Attorney Dewey approved the top-secret Operation Underworld. 
the Navy's Secret Service made contact with the Mafia. Soon afterwards, the docks became safer, the sabotaging stopped, and so did the strikes in the factories. The Allied countries against Nazi fascism could now count on yet another ally, Cosa Nostra. The government within the government, the underworld, had entered the Second World War. Cooperation with the Mafia extended to the Allied forces landing in Sicily on the 9th of July 1943 in a huge naval operation. It is said that a lone American tank arrived in the village of Villalba. A soldier called out to Don Vizzini on a bullhorn. When he approached the tank, the soldier waved the symbol of the collaboration with the Mafia, a handkerchief with an L, as in Lucky Luciano. But there's no need for hearsay. In the heart of the war zone, a combat cameraman filmed a fisherman's boat transporting a man of honor on his way to boarding a military ship. In 1943, an Allied military government was formed in Italy, headed by attorney at law, Charles Poletti. A year before, Poletti had been the temporary governor of New York, right after the fire on the Normandy, at the peak of Operation Underworld. He held this post for just a few weeks, enough time for him to pardon a few Mafia men. Vito Genovese managed to get hired as a translator in military governor Poletti's office. He was fired only when his file landed on the desk of the chief of staff. Before the Allies, several godfathers claimed to be anti-fascists. They said they had been persecuted by Mori, the prefect of iron, sent to Sicily by Mussolini. A few of them were even appointed mayors, among them Calogero Vizzini, the godfather of Villalba. After the Second World War, a separatist movement was born in Sicily in favor of annexing the Italian island to the United States of America. One of the leaders of this movement was Godfather Don Calogero Vizzini. In Rome, it was time for elections to form the first democratic government after 20 years of dictatorship. The Communist Party, many of whose members had played a major role in the war of resistance against Nazi fascism, wanted seats in the new Italian cabinet. They would never allow Sicily to become part of the United States. The Americans prepared a top secret plan to reoccupy Sicily if the Communists won. As usual, injustices were frequent on the island. But the rationing of flour brought one injustice too many, and a young man reacted by opening fire. Salvatore Giuliano became a gang leader, one of the top fighters in the separatist movement, which made him commander of the Revolutionary Army. But annexing Sicily to America meant stopping the communists first. On the 1st of May 1947, Labor Day, Salvatore Giuliano's men took aim at the workers demonstrating in Portella delle Ginestre near Palermo. It was a massacre. On the 18th of April 1948, after a dramatic electoral campaign, election day arrived. The communists lost. But Salvatore Giuliano knew he was in trouble. 
With the new democratic order in place in Rome, Sicily would never become part of the United States. He knew he had become useless. His gang drew the attention of the police, disturbing the underworld's business. The Godfathers issued the death sentence. Giuliano was killed on the 5th of May, 1950. The bandit becomes a myth after many years, when the murders he has committed are forgotten. Salvatore Giuliano was a bandit responsible for the murder of many innocent people. Yet he had posed as a guerrilla fighter. It's a fact that the criminal in disguise helps to reduce the criminal profile of the Mafia itself. The bandit Giuliano, as he is still called, was a criminal. As a guerrilla fighter, Salvatore Giuliano had fallen in love. A son was born to him, named after his father, Salvatore Giuliano. When trouble came, Giuliano had his son taken out of Sicily through the Mafia's secret network. When that boy became a man, not uncharacteristically, he denied the very existence of the Mafia. It's the Italian government that says they're godfathers. We'll have to see. The word godfather means a mafioso. Since the Mafia doesn't exist, godfathers cannot exist. In the United States, the help and cooperation of the Mafia during the Second World War did not go unrewarded. Lucky Luciano's 30-year sentence vanished into thin air. He was released from prison in 1946. Someone even proposed that the US Congress award him a medal, as if he were a war hero. This man was not a hero. He was a very bad man. He was a criminal. And criminals deserve to be off the streets. They shouldn't be roaming the streets of this city, or any city, for that matter. The motion for the medal was soon forgotten. After all, Luciano was still a criminal. He was sent to Italy on the condition that he never returned to America again. Invisibly and silently, Lucky Luciano immediately set out to solidify relations with Don Calogero Vizzini of Villalba, the only Sicilian godfather he really trusted. Lucky Luciano was, of course, a highly intelligent and efficient criminal who was a bridgehead in Italy and made business between the two organizations easier, creating more consistency between them. In the 1950s, the economy of Italy began to change dramatically. It started to become a modern industrialized country. Inevitably, the Sicilian Mafia that had remained bound to the private land estates began to die out. It was time to breed a new generation of mafiosi. Lucky Luciano and Don Vizzini would take care of that. In America, in the 50s, the Commission, the Mafia's board of directors, was helmed by five families. The Gambinos, the Genoveses, the Bonannos, the Colombos, and the Lucchese's. Well, I think the role that was uh, typified in the Godfather movies never existed. That was a highly romantic uh, view of uh, what many people say was modeled after Carlo Gambino, but every Mafia family in Sicily and the families in the United States are vicious criminals, vicious murderers. Uh, they are not romantic family individuals uh, as were portrayed. The title character in the movie The Godfather was actually inspired by a number of different real-life Godfathers all former pupils of Lucky Luciano's Mafia School. Carlo Gambino was the smartest of them all. His rise as a godfather began in 1946 when Luciano was deported to Italy. Luciano was his role model. 
From him, Gambino learned to keep a low profile. When somebody said he was a coward, he let them talk. He knew his true weapon was his intelligence. In 1947, after just a year in Italy, Lucky Luciano already felt Italy was too small for him. But he couldn't go back to the States, so he settled for the next best thing, Cuba. Another mafia heaven where the American godfathers had expanded their business with casinos and nightclubs. As in Atlantic City in 1929, Luciano called for another underworld conference, the Havana Conference. Like any ordinary tourist, lucky Luciano left Italy and reached Cuba. There he met up with his old friend Maya Lansky and other middle-aged godfathers. In Cuba, Luciano explained his plan to the other godfathers, what today would be called a global market for drugs. The Mafia has a kind of stock market. The major drug shipments had cartels, which were groups of family bosses that coordinated the purchase of a huge drug shipment, going on someone's word, and then it was split among the members of the cartel, who guaranteed the payment for what they had purchased. At the Havana conference, Luciano laid out his grand plan to expand this business. The drugs would be produced in the Far East, where the governments pretended not to see the enormous plantations. The refining process would then be entrusted to the Italians in Sicily. Cuba was to be the distribution point. To bring in the refined drugs, they could rely on the Italian emigrants still leaving Italy, connected to the Mafia through their families in the United States. They were undercover journeys, like the old lady who visits her relatives in the United States and smuggles in one or two kilos of heroin, or store owners who sneak in a small amount compared to the enormous quantity that was refined. It was called the RAIN method. Many godfathers like Vito Genovese and Don Calogero Vizzini entered a new business, this time legal importing canned food, another perfect way to conceal the drugs. At first the whole thing was underestimated. No one thought that behind all this lay drug smuggling. No one thought that drug smuggling could directly involve Sicily. Ironically, the canned food business run by the Godfathers was a success in its own right. Cosa Nostra began dealing in drugs back in the 50s, and it improved this business over two decades, almost three, succeeding not only to become a part of the worldwide drug business, but also to manage it on its own, thanks to the Far East and Middle East production sources of morphine, the huge Western markets, and its own very safe and profitable distribution channels. In Palermo in 1957, managing the global drug market had proved more difficult than Luciano and the other godfathers had anticipated ten years before. In a changing world, it was time to call for another meeting. In March 1957, at the Hotel La Palma in Palermo, a meeting was held of the highest historical criminal relevance, of course. It was the occasion to gather around a table, and for several days, the leading personalities of the American Cosa Nostra, from New York to Buffalo, 
to Detroit and other areas of the states, with leading Cosa Nostra personalities from Palermo and other towns in Sicily. For the underworld, it would be an historic conference. All the Godfathers attended. If we want to find a definition for the Palme meeting, we can sum it up as follows. The Italian Mafia modelled itself on the Americans, without abdicating its authority to the American cousins, and it opened very profitable channels for drug trafficking. A few months after the Palermo conference, Vito Genovese, on his own initiative, called for another meeting, this time in America. The Appalachian Conference in upstate New York was held in late 1957. So we believe that the main purpose was for the bosses of the American families to decide whether or not they would engage jointly in heroin trafficking with their cousins from Sicily. In Italy, Luciano immediately understood that Vito Genovese's real purpose was to take control of the commission. To the meeting, he sent only the astute Carlo Gambino, ordering his men to stay away. Then he tipped off the New York Police Department. There would be national meetings involving the families from all over the country. And of course, that's what, was, uh, that's what was interrupted and discovered in Appalachian, New York in the late 1950s. They were having a national meeting of all of, the, all of the families. That was rare. Those kinds of meetings took place infrequently because they were too dangerous. The New York Police Department raided the meeting and arrested a few of the Godfathers, including Carlo Gambino. He had been Lucky Luciano's sacrificial lamb. The FBI was caught off guard by Luciano's move. After years spent saying the Mafia didn't exist, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover got to work. Cosa Nostra had lost its legendary invisibility. In Italy, in the mid-50s, a man would cross the path of the Seven Sisters, the major international oil companies. His name was Enrico Mattei. As the president of Argeep, Italy's state-owned oil company, he would interfere with the huge business of black gold. He would have to be stopped, and the Mafia could be very useful. Enrico Mattei had been one of the great resistance commanders during the Second World War. He was one of those who had decided to send in a unit to arrest Mussolini. The unit had captured Mussolini before the Allies could. On the 29th of April 1945, he was shot and hung by the feet in Milan to be shown to the crowd. After the war, Mattei could have held any prestigious political position. Unexpectedly, he asked for a seemingly dead-end state-owned oil company named Ajeep. And then Mattei found oil everywhere. In just a few years, he quickly rose in the global market of black gold in which the entire planet's interests were at stake. He laid the foundations for Italy's economic boom of the 1960s. He reached agreements with the Russian communists and the Arab countries for the exploitation of their oil fields. Soon, Mate became a problem for the major international oil companies. They realized their monopoly over black gold was in danger. On the 27th of October 1962, he boarded a private jet in Sicily. He took off from Catania at 4.57 p.m. Exactly two hours later, at 6.57 p.m., the plane crashed in Bescape, 
Mia Milano. La mafia tenta di uccidere nella maniera più efficace possibile. The mafia tries to kill in the most efficient way, without leaving any traces. The mafia says that a perfect murder is one that eliminated the body and eliminates the memory of it. The crash of the plane carrying Enrico Mattei was ruled an accident. In September 1994, however, the investigation was reopened. A mafia informer, Gaetano Iani, testified that Mattei's plane had been sabotaged by the Sicilian Mafia as a favor to their American cousins. There is still no official verdict on the case. The Mafia kills to get rid of a potential enemy, a potential adversary, someone who can harm the family, or it gives a warning to the others. Be aware of what you're doing. This is how you'll end up. In Naples on the 26th of January 1962, Lucky Luciano was conducting business as usual when he collapsed on the floor of the Naples airport with a heart attack. He was about to negotiate the rights to his biography to make a book and a film. Back in New York City in 1962, Joe Valacci, a soldier in the family of Vito Genovese was arrested for drugs offenses. When Valacci was taken in, his boss was not confident he would keep his mouth shut. Three times he tried to have him killed in prison. Genovese was right. On the 13th of July 1962, Joe Valacci became the most famous mafia informer up to that time. The indifference that used to characterize most people's attitude toward the Mafia had changed. There is much less of it. People realize the Mafia is a criminal phenomenon, and that may lead to the end of the Mafia. The wall of silence that had surrounded the Mafia for decades showed its first cracks. In Italy, however, one Mafia informer's predicament was quite different. His name was Leonardo Vitale, a man of honor of the family of Altarello near Palermo. In 1973, he explained to the judges how the Mafia was really a single powerful organization with branches throughout the world. The court thought him mad and locked him up in a psychiatric ward. The killers waited 10 years. On the 2nd of December 1984, when he finally left the asylum, Leonardo Vitale was killed. Everyone had to know that speaking against the Mafia meant death. In Italy, princes, barons and counts had been a part of the Mafia ever since its origins. Even Joseph Bonanno, one of the founding members of the American Underworlds Commission, was a nobleman. The bronze door in Pisa's Duomo is named after the Bonanno family, one of the oldest in town. However, he did not like to be called Don. He preferred to be called the father. I mean, he's, he's one of those pe people about which you would say, if he had gone in another direction, he could have been very successful. Fortunately, he sought the direction of crime. But then he tried to, I think, insulate himself from facing what it was all about with these pretensions of, this is like a government, this is like, I'm like the head of, head of state, which he's said, and I'm like a deposed head of state when he was finally retired. By the mid-60s, Joseph Bonanno nurtured the plan to kill all the members of the commission and become the big mafia chief of New York City. In 1964, the commission got wind of his plan and kidnapped him. They advised him it was time for him to abdicate. Wisely enough, he agreed. Carlo Gambino didn't make the same choice as Bonanno. 
he remained in control of his family until his dying day. He had learned Lucky Luciano's lesson on invisibility perfectly, better than any other godfather. When he died in 1976, his role was taken over by Big Paul Castellano. He had a true temper. He was so contentious that even his soldiers hated him. He didn't have the right stuff to be a real godfather. He was killed in front of a New York City steakhouse in 1985. There have been plenty of Italian-American heroes in law enforcement, but these are not well known. These were not the subjects of series. These were not the subjects of one blockbuster movie after another. These were not four-hour spectaculars. You know, these were not series like The Sopranos. What works in this country is blood dripping from a stiletto, rape, crushing a man's head with a golf club uh, uh, because your boss ordered you to do it, Italian-American thugs, even the Italians go watch it. In Sicily, in the mid-50s, Corleone, a small town 30 miles south of Palermo, had for decades been under the criminal domination of Don Michele Navarra, a physician godfather whose only interest was power. until Luciano Ligio, one of his soldiers, began his own rise to power. When he felt the time was right, on the 2nd of August, 1958, Ligio killed Don Navarra. He usurped the throne and formed the Corleone gang, who would become one of the most ruthless in the history of the Mafia. He expanded his activity to northern Italy. In 1973, he kidnapped Paul Getty III, the grandson of oil tycoon Paul Getty Sr., and cut off his earlobe to convince the family to pay the ransom. He was arrested in Milan in 1974 and sentenced to life. His position in Corleone was taken over by Totorina, known as Toto the Shorty because of his height. Five foot two. He was short, but had ambitions. Without consulting anyone, in full violation of any rule of the commission, the Corleone gang of Totorina started killing the other godfathers to make room for themselves in the drug market. No attack on government officials, had been Lucky Luciano's order many years before. But by the mid-70s, his lesson had faded away. In Sicily, the Corleone gang killed policemen and carabinieri. Some of the organized crime figures are among the most vicious, horrible, awful human beings you'd ever meet, almost animalistic in, in quality. And some of them, except for the criminal part of their life, they can be very nice people. <laughs> Corleone struggled to be known not only as the mafia capital of Italy. It must be said that Corleone has taken some huge steps forward, considering the impenetrable omata that existed. It has changed a lot. There has been an awakening, an exceptional renaissance. Michele Sindona was born in Patti, near Messina, in 1920. A mathematical and financial genius, he would reach dizzying heights laundering dirty money for the Mafia, both in Italy and America. Until one day, he ran into an old-fashioned gentleman. His name was Giorgio Ambrosoli. 
He was an attorney at law, and his job was to pursue Michele Sindona, the banker godfather. The son of a mortician, Michele Sindona had proved to be a mathematical genius while still at school. Through laundering dirty money for the Mafia, both in Italy and the United States, he became the banker godfather. In Milan, on the 27th of September 1974, Giorgio Ambrosoli, a man of great moral integrity, was assigned by the court to liquidate one of the many firms controlled by the banker godfather, Michele Sindona. In his thorough investigation, Ambrosoli uncovered the secrets of the Sindona empire and his ties with the mafia. In 1972, in the US, Sindona had bought the Franklin National Bank, and this acquisition was currently under investigation by the American judges. They asked Ambrosoli to testify in their case against Sindona. Shortly after his testimony, Giorgio Ambrosoli was killed in Milan. The Italian police traced the hitman back to Michele Sindona, who was arrested. Laundering dirty money from drug smuggling and other illegal activities required moving it around quickly. When Sindona ended up in jail, all the money he controlled stopped spinning. From outside, the Godfather sent Sindona a message. They wanted to know where their money was. Sindona knew he was lost and threatened to talk. In 1986, he was 65. At his age, he should have known better than to threaten the Godfathers. Sindona had a coffee in his cell. Drinking it was his last mistake. It was laced with cyanide. Stefano Bontate had changed his last name. It used to be Bonta, meaning goodness in Italian. He didn't love invisibility as a don. He intended to exercise his authority as a godfather by living in luxury and mixing with high society in Palermo. Bontate decided to stop the power of the Corleone gang. The bloodshed continued in the streets of Sicily. He sought new alliances in the Masonic lodges and the corrupted members of the Italian secret services. He moved to strengthen ties with the American cousins. But the members of the commission didn't approve of the war underway in Sicily. It was against the rules of the American Cosa Nostra to use bombs and to kill innocent people, as the Corleone families were doing. They were told in very strong terms that if they came to the United States, conducted criminal operations in the United States, they were not allowed to use that type of terror uh, within the United States. They were not to do it. They were not to attract attention of law enforcement and the American public by engaging in those type of activities here. The American Cosa Nostra decided to separate themselves from the Sicilians, and the agreements taken at the Hotel Le Palme conference back in 1957 were essentially cancelled. I don't believe there still are many structural relations or intensely strategic theories like those studied at the Hotel La Palme conference in Palermo in 1957. Stefano Bontate never made it to become the godfather of Corleone. He was killed in Palermo on the 23rd of April 1981. 
His murder triggered off yet another full-scale mafia war in Italy. This time, though, the Corleone gangs went too far in their war. They claimed too many casualties among the Italian police and the judges, too many innocent people. In Palermo alone, the body count escalated from 101 to 150 in just a year. In the early 80s, Tommaso Buscetta tried to take over the defeated families. He was one of the older godfathers, still alive and in charge. He managed the drug smuggling business between Europe, Asia and both North and South America. I don't know if Buscetta had been appointed to fill in Bontate's role, but I do know he had been asked to return to Palermo and meet with everyone who had remained loyal to Bontate and Badalamenti in order to stir up against the Corleone gangsters. Buscetta didn't make it. The Corleone gangs forced him to flee for his life. He went to Brazil. In October 1983, Buscetta was arrested in Rio de Janeiro in a joint operation by the Italian police and Interpol. When Italian judge Giovanni Falcone went to Brazil to interrogate him, Buscetta decided Falcone was a man he could trust. He decided to talk. In July 1984, he was extradited to Italy. Judge Falcone wanted an uninterrupted story. He let Buscetta speak freely, even when he described his age-old mafia in romantic terms. He tries to validate his role as a pure mafioso, a mafioso who follows all principles and does not concede to drug trafficking, and by trying to resort to violence as little as possible. Letting him say what he wants is actually an interrogation technique. Meanwhile, we verify how it all really went, checking things independently when necessary. In Palermo on the 23rd of May 1992, Toto Reina and his Corleonese men struck at the Italian government by killing Judge Giovanni Falcone, his wife and their bodyguards with a bomb. A few months later, they also killed Judge Paola Borsellino and his bodyguards. Both judges had been instrumental in gathering the evidence for what was called in Italy the first maxi trial against the Mafia in the late 80s. In December 1987, at the end of this trial, the court in Palermo found 344 defendants guilty out of 456, sentencing 19 of them to life. The Mafia would take revenge. It lashed out at Italy's artistic heritage. On the 9th of May 1993, even the Pope, on his visit to Sicily, cried his outrage at such mayhem. Mafia non può cambiare. The Mafia cannot alter and scorn the holiest right given by God. This people, the Sicilian people, cannot always live under the pressure of an opposing force, a force of death. I say this to those responsible, convert yourselves. God's judgment will come. Once again, the Mafia had gone too far. One by one, the Corleone gangsters were captured. Toto Riina was arrested in Palermo on the 25th of January 1993. He was tried, found guilty, 
and sentenced to life. Many of the American La Cosa Nostra families, uh, they are reluctant to even name one single boss because of the law enforcement efforts that are made against them, particularly by the FBI. According to both the Italians and the Americans, there are no longer godfathers like they used to be. Once upon a time, Cosa Nostra bosses had to be invisible as mafiosi, but recognizable as godfathers. Now, they can only hide. Cosa Nostra sta tentando Casa Nostra is trying to resume its business without doing anything outrageous, so they can avoid the governments and investigative bodies key to the changes taking place. In order to survive, Casa Nostra has to disguise itself in silence. But without the guidance of the great godfathers, the Mafia has failed to regain its age-old invisibility it has become vulnerable. We can't afford to relax because the Mafia takes advantage of those moments, becoming stronger than it was before. Silence and peace are what it wants. There's talk of a Russian Mafia, a Japanese Mafia, a Colombian Mafia, and many others worldwide. Although they are established criminal organizations, they are not the Mafia as we have come to know it. The real Mafia has gone. All the great godfathers are dead. But many of the traditional Mafia activities are alive and well.